morning and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, Identifying Best Practices, an Interdisciplinary Online Course for FASD Prevention, Intervention, and Support. So excited to have all of you here today. Before we begin, I just wanted to give an acknowledgement um, to the people and the land. And so I wanted to acknowledge that CANFAST is a virtual network. We are gathering here today from diverse lands across Turtle Island and we pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging and the land in which we work, live and play. I am joining from the traditional territory of the Wendat Anishinaabe, Métis, Mississaugas, the new credit. And I really wanted to affirm my commitment to the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that were released just over five years ago, and particularly calls 33 and 34 as they relate to FASD prevention and justice. I also really just wanted to take this moment to thank my colleagues at the Canada FASD Research Network, um, including Andrew Rath, who is facilitating today, um, Kathy Unsworth, Audrey McFarlane, and then doctors Nancy Poole, Jackie Pye, and Jocelyn Cook, who are really uh, influential in the creation of the modules in which we'll talk about today. So as I mentioned, my name is Lindsay Wolfson. I'm a settler with ancestry from Poland and Russia, and my background is actually in anti-violence and anti-human trafficking. I previously worked in Vietnam for uh, a number of organizations in policy creation and development in these areas, and now I'm a researcher at the Canada FASD Research Network and the manager at the Centre of Excellence for Women's Health. So today's presentation will be about best practices for prevention, intervention, and support, an online course that will be released on the CANFAS website in the next few months. This course was developed with funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada and was really designed for people who are working in the areas of substance use, mental health, housing, employment, and justice. Um, and it will be actually available from the CANFAS eStore for free for one year. So we really hope that you check it out. And so as we go through this core, uh, presentation today, I'm not only going to be talking about how the course came to be, but also some ident um, foundational ideas for the course, and then walking you through some of the examples of what's included in the modules themselves. But before we begin, I just really want to orient us with who we are at CANFAST. So we are a national research network um, and we produce a range of research uh, talking about the complexities of FASD. Our mission is to develop research that can be shared nationally and inform prevention strategies and improve support for women, girls and people affected by FASD. CANFAST has uh, seven staff, a family advisory committee who are a committed group of parents, caregivers of individuals with FASD and individuals with FASD themselves, the AFFECT committee, um, seven research leads who work in the areas of prevention, child welfare, intervention, justice and data management. And I just wanna reiterate, I am not an expert in all of these fields. I'm quite far from it. Um, but I really hope that you see through this presentation today, the importance of us being a multidisciplinary network and the importance of that being the foundation for the course in which we'll be talking about. So a few grounding and foundational ideas to start us off today. First, the standard definition of FASD. With all of the information that's been released over the last 35 years, We've really been working recently to create a common definition that can be used in a Canadian context. And we truly believe that if all government service agencies and researchers use a common definition, it will reduce stigma, given that many of the existing definitions may use incorrect or outdated information. It will increase understanding of FASD. It will provide a strengths rather than deficits-based definition. And this definition, again, was created in collaboration from staff, research leads, the Canada Northwest Partnership, and several other governments, service agencies, and territories. Um, and part of creating the standard definition is that it really is working to reduce stigma. 
And so I want to start us off with why this is so important. Stigma and discrimination can really be experienced across different sectors. It can be felt from the public, from the education system, different workplaces, child welfare system, health and social services. And it's so pervasive and it really impacts um, and can have adverse effects on mothers, individual support networks, and individuals who work with those with FASD. And so I think it's really important that we situate ourselves in understanding what stigma is and the role of stigma around FASD and why developing courses are so important. For individuals um, with FASD, stigma can influence the ability to receive a diagnosis. Stigmatization can result in providers feeling unprepared to diagnose or support children with FASD um, and not having the confidence to or failing to accurately diagnose an individual with FASD or refer individuals to necessary services and supports can impede individuals from receiving the assistance and care that they truly need. For women, um, stigma is one of the big, biggest barriers to accessing care and practitioners really providing care. Discriminating, discrimination towards women um, who have substance use problems and become pregnant and inconsistent messaging around substance use and pregnancy can deter women from seeking the help that they and their children need and it undermines access to proper medical care. Um, and for women who are aware of the risks of alcohol use but are really struggling to abstain from alcohol for a number of reasons, whether it be social pressure, life circumstance, addiction, violence or trauma, having judgmental attitudes um, from practitioners can perpetuate shame and women may avoid accessing prenatal care of, out of fear of judgment or out of fear of child removal. And so the results of these narratives can really cause providers not to ask all women of childbearing years um, about their substance use, but only ask certain populations that are falsely stereotyped. And so those women in particular may feel unsafe or reluctant to have discussions around alcohol use and may be afraid to accurately report their alcohol use. Luckily, there are so many ways in which we can reduce stigma. We can improve public messaging and, and perception. Um, one individual from the Changing the Conversation Forum back in 2018 said, Without stigma, I would feel freedom, inclusion, equality, a sense of belonging, a willingness to speak up and seek support without the cost that's required. We could build everyone up. There would be less fighting, more accommodations, more diagnoses and families coming together. And those words from that participant really highlight the need for us to um, reduce stigma. And on this slide here, I just have a couple of ways that we are able to do so. So here are a few of examples of education materials that can be used. There are so many language guides, a number of them are available through the Canada FASD Research Network. Um, we have the standard definition and then a couple of the resources that I'll be talking about today, including doorways to conversation. But more than that, we need to continue to work across these different domains in order to uh, reduce stigma for both uh, women and also individuals who have FASD. One way that CANFAST has been doing this is through online courses. And so CANFAST has been working on a number of evidence-based and up-to-date courses for a range of providers. The foundations course, um, which you'll see at the bottom there is uh, free to everyone. And then there are supplemental, let's call them level two courses that include prevention training, a course for school personnel, um, for justice workers, for child welfare workers, and then the level three course we have there, realizing, realizing there's a typo on that slide, um, which is about multidisciplinary diagnostic team training. And by increasing the availability of virtual courses in a range of sectors, we're able to increase supports um, to individuals with FASD or who may be at risk of having an alcohol exposed pregnancy 
And these courses really act as a catalyst for stigma reduction by increasing awareness, equipping providers with tools and resources to work with individuals, um, and increasing their confidence and competence to support individuals with FASD. And these online courses are part of a larger workforce development plan um, to train everyone in Canada who will encounter somebody with FASD in their work. So let's talk about the course itself, best practices for prevention, intervention, and support. So how did we get here? Well, we saw that there was a need for multidisciplinary training um, and we really wanted to build off of emerging evidence. So in 2019, uh, researchers from CANFAST met in Kelowna and we started talking about how we could build off of existing courses um, to really make this, this module that was available for folks in multiple professions. And we identified that we needed to streamline and have one course that could go across the FASD continuum of care that could provide education about FASD, um, supports to direct service, and equips providers in a range of sectors with tools to support both individuals with FASD and women. And so these were the objectives that we came up with for the course to really give an overview of FASD and its manifestations and implications, provide information of current approaches and strategies for FASD and provide resources to screen and support individuals with FASD. Um, and so, as I mentioned, this course is really built for a range of providers in substance use and mental health, housing, employment, justice, and other service delivery fields. And these settings were really seen as ideal opportunities to implement an integrated approach in improving outcomes for individuals with FASD and screening for FASD and really just supporting success. And so by building this course that goes and is multidisciplinary, we're also able to talk about um, working across the entire lifespan and continuum of care. So this course is actually going to be replacing the Towards Improved Practice. The course that exists currently on the website is three main modules. Um, the first one is similar to the first module I'll be talking about today, uh, which provides an intro to FASD. It really builds off of the foundations course as a reminder to what folks in that level one course will have taken. Then in the um, existing Towards Improved Practice, the second module was about providing support to individuals with FASD. And the third module was about FASD prevention and screening. And when we came together in Kelowna, we realized that we had the opportunity to update this course, bringing in more information about the social determinants of health and how we can work across, across the lifespan. And so by doing that, we're really starting off by talking about prevention, creating a separate module for screening for FASD, and then highlighting available supports and strategies. And so the format for the new course is four modules. The modules take 20 to 45 minutes to complete. They integrate a lot of links to resources, videos, and other content. And it builds off of these two documents that were recently released, Towards Healthy Outcomes and Doorways to Conversation. And one thing I'll mention as we continue to go through, you'll notice that there are a lot of links to resources. I haven't provided those links um, below and part of it is because they're all available through the course and we really, really want you to take this free course for the next year. And so the two links, if you would like them, that will be available are Towards Healthy Outcomes, which is available from the CanFast website, and Doorways to Conversation, which is available from the Center of Excellence for Women's Health website. And again, um, we can put the links in the chat box for everyone. So as I mentioned again, this first module, module one, we're really hoping to describe FASD, its prevalence, physical and mental health, economic and social impacts, and understand assessment, diagnosis, and terminology that will be used throughout the modules. It builds off of what folks learned in the foundations course. Um, it really, again, highlights that in our the research we have right now um, for 
percent of the population is affected by FASD, which is equivalent to about 1.5 million Canadians. Um, and it really, in this module, we articulate the strengths and skills of individuals with FASD and rearticulates the diversity of individuals with FASD. In the second module, we end up talking more about prevention, screening for alcohol use in pregnancy and the social determinants of health. So learning the facts about drinking during pregnancy and factors that may increase risk of FASD, understanding the various levels of FASD prevention and how to provide brief alcohol interventions and recognize the importance of screening for alcohol use during pregnancy and how to implement screening strategies. I'm gonna put a quick disclaimer that I primarily work in prevention. So you may see that I'm talking a lot about this particular module because I was really excited about it. Um, but there are lots of strategies across all four. So in this particular module, folks may learn um, that there are a variety of factors that can impact women's drinking during pregnancy, including alcohol use before pregnancy, having an unplanned pregnancy, a history of substance use disorders, um, not being able to access prenatal care, experiencing historic or intergenerational trauma. And this is a really important thing to think about right now. And part of it um, is that increasingly we're seeing the gender gap, the differences between men and women's consumption is decreasing. And so, and we're seeing increased rates of alcohol use in COVID. So understanding why there may be alcohol use in pregnancy is a really good thing for us. It can really help destigmatize um, and really help us think about how we can support individuals who may be drinking during pregnancy. The module then walks through these four different levels of FASD prevention, which again are multi-leveled and multi-sectoral and really work to holistically support. In this first level of prevention, you see broad awareness and health promotion efforts. In the second, um, discussion of alcohol use and related risks, which we saw in the objective. It's one of our goals is to really think through this level two area of prevention. In level three, we walk through specialized holistic support and then level four postpartum support. And so strategies that you may encounter as service providers in level one, it may be the development or the distribution of health promotion materials. So pamphlets, posters, low risk drinking guidelines, facilitation materials. And so a couple of the examples you'll see in the modules um, are This Is Why, which is from the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute, which talks about why fathers are supporting um, in reduced alcohol in pregnancy. The next one from the uh, Yukon government on let's meet at the coffee bar. It's one of my favorites, so funny and really accessible. And again, destigmatizing. Um, and the third is the low risk alcohol drinking guidelines, which articulate that it's safest not to drink during pregnancy. The second level is really where we put most of our um, breath in this in the second module. And part of it is that the second level is really what doorways to conversation, this document that I referred to focuses on. Um, it was the development of that document was a one year process. We worked with different types of service providers ranging from anti-violence workers midwives, nurses, indigenous health providers, um, sexual health providers, etc., to really understand how they were able to engage with women. And so this document, I, I think, really helps situate the course because it was built off of the voices of providers, of how they could engage with women and have these conversations. And really, through that, the document articulates that it's important to be non-judgmental and empathic, ask women what they know about alcohol use, work with women to understand the role of substance use, and encourage small steps. And brief interventions, some may know, often fall into this model of screening, brief intervention, and referral. And you'll see in the modules that we do refer to screening tools. We have 
examples of the audit C, the TAs, craft and tweak, but some social um, service providers may not feel comfortable using those. And that may be that screening may not fit into the existing practice approach, or it may not be validated for their demographic they work with. And as this course is really geared towards um, social care providers, it may just not fit into practice approaches that uh, folks are used to working with. So engaging in brief interventions can really be seen as a doorway to conversation that we can engage in all of these different conversations, no matter what our position is. And I've provided this checklist, which is available, um, which shows the different ways in which we can access these conversations. So, uh, you know, it could start on a conversation about contraception use and FASD, or it could be about breastfeeding. There are lots of different avenues and this module really outlines the different ways in which um, providers are able to engage in these conversations and, and ideally um, build their confidence and their competence in their ability to have these conversations. And as we talk about how this course is really meant to be multidisciplinary, um, I think it's really important. I don't actually think this is in the course itself, but that we pull this out. And this is a slide that shows just how existing evidence approaches and values are reflected in these sorts of conversations. So really you'll see client-centered meeting where the client is at, um, identifying client strategies and it's strength-based, and then it's relevance to brief interventions that girls and women have the capacity to find their own goals and solutions with support from service providers. And so this is a really helpful thing for us to think about how does our own practice, how do us, how do we as service providers, as researchers, as policymakers um, relate to these approaches and how we can we support women from there? We continue through the module and we start talking about level three support. Um, and level three is providing specialized holistic support to pregnant women. And again, I think this image right here, which is integrated in the course, is super important because it talks about the different types of services women need um, and how they were engaging in them. And so this is actually from a study called Co-Creating Evidence. And um, the researchers are working with eight FASD prevention that hit this sort of level three, level four um, area. And you can see that food and nutrition, housing, basic needs, women's health, all of these are really required to support women. So whether you're a directly working in substance use or maybe you work in child welfare or in a nutrition program, you can see that understanding both FASD, but also um, how to support women who may be at risk for prenatal alcohol exposure, um, it's so important to, to our care approaches. And then this last level here, which is about postpartum support. And all of the modules finish and they have best practices. So going back through all of the information that you will have already learned about and then summarizing it so it's really tangible um, and you can really reflect on how you can use the strategies that have been referred to throughout. In the third module, the goal is to talk about assessment and screening for FASD. So understanding the advantages and challenges, identifying population and setting specific screening tools, understanding again, unique strengths and needs and recognizing opportunities to collaborate um, to support individuals with FASD. And so we start off, the module begins with the six steps for FASD related screening assessment, diagnosis and services. And really this particular module is focusing on those steps one through three. So looking at screening tools and it's not really articulating that the screening process isn't meant to forego diagnosis, but can provide a process for identifying FASD as a possible diagnosis and re-articulating that um, screening should be used in conjunction with local diagnostic services 
and really should be paired with knowing that there are additional supports after. And so screening we in this module, we say it's so important because it's cost effective. It's an efficient way of identifying if individuals may be at risk of having FASD. It can prompt a referral to diagnosis. Um, and um, it really does require a recommended and validated screening tool and, and knowing that there are subsequent resources for diagnosis and for appropriate interventions and supports. And by making sure that screening is paired with diagnosis and um, interventions, we're really able to reduce the effects of developmental disabilities among children um, and really ensure that we are supporting across the lifespan. And so in this module, we outline a number of screening tools. I've just highlighted three of them here. And so starting off, we walk through the National Screening Toolkit, um, which was created by the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. In the middle, we have the Medicine Wheel Student Index, which was developed by the Eastern Door Clinic in Elsie Moktuk. And screening um, in this case is First Nations, particularly Mi'kmaq specific. And um, the screening process is done by teachers and counselors in schools. And lastly, we have the FASD screening and referral tool for probation officers, um, which was developed by the Asante Center. And that tool in particular takes about five to 10 minutes to administer. And you'll notice as you go through that, the third module is that we, we do talk about diagnosis, but we don't provide a lot of detail because we really want to ensure that screening isn't used in lieu of diagnosis. And also there is an entire course, that level three course, um, which is available on the diagnostic process. So our last and final module is about supporting healthy outcomes. And so in this module, really looking to identify the 12 intervention domains and how they can be considered, understand how to implement intervention approaches that optimize opportunities and success for individuals with FASD, um, recognize opportunities for collaboration with a range of health and social service providers. And so this module, again, like module two, just gives so much information um, and so many possible resources. And this module was also built off of a recently released um, document. This was released in 2018 towards healthy outcomes, which really does provide the backdrop. Um, and what we mean by healthy outcomes here are interventions that meaningfully support and emphasize healthy living for individuals with FASD. So it's focusing on building healthy outcomes rather than addressing individuals' deficits. So we're encouraging providers to build off of strengths and address um, challenging areas in order to uh, ensure that individuals with FASD succeed. And this particular model um, provides intervention areas for a range of different social um, and health service providers and is intended to create a shared understanding of intervention goals, increase consistency and develop um, and intentionality in delivering strengths-based intervention and also create a shared language and shared philosophy. And as I mentioned, that is a really pertinent thing to reducing stigma. And so this is the intervention uh, model itself. It, you can see that the model um, starts at the beginning with infancy, with physical health and attachment, and then goes across the lifespan thinking about mental health and regulation, community engagement, employment, and parenting skills. And this last module as a result is really built to mirror this particular module. So it starts off by thinking through um, interventions at infancy and in childhood uh, with thinking about physical health and attachment. And then as individuals age, we start discussing um, how service providers can work in community engagement on adaptive skills, parenting, et cetera. And so again, chock full of resources here. And I would say of all of the modules, this particular module, because we're building on these 12 different domains has the most amount of resources in it. 
it really encourages folks who are taking the course to watch videos, look through these resources and think about their the implications for their own practice. For example, the module starts off with a video from Miles Himmelreich to think through some of the physical and whole body um, effects of FASD on individuals and then walk people through what primary health interventions like medication, health education, physical activities can be used to support individuals. In this early section of the fourth module, we also talk about attachment and family cohesion. And while those may be interventions that are largely based in the home, there is definitely a role of a range of health and social care providers. Providers can support individuals through um, psychotherapy and psychoeducation. So we make mention to the Connect program, a 10 week parenting program. Um, and we also talk about the importance of stable home placements in being critical to both attachment and also cohesion. And just highlighting that children and adolescents who are removed from their home may struggle to maintain um, a previous attachment um, and really while well, also trying to build new relationships. And so by having resources linked here, like the one from the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies, uh, we're linking to a resource that provides discussion uh, questions for healthcare workers or child welfare workers to consider. And then as a social service provider, we also have the capacity to link to resources like I am a caregiver, um, which can just be another way of supporting the families that you work with. The module continues um, and starts discussing how to support teens and adults with FASD. And so considering um, the mental health challenges that uh, individuals may experience and just that um, individuals with FASD experience actually higher rates of mental health problems, including emotional and, and psychological disorders. And so providing resources that can be supportive um, for you as a ser service provider to support individuals who may be struggling with mental health challenges. In this section of the course, we also talk about um, considerations for working with FAS children um, who are transitioning to adulthood. Um, so information that may be included in a, in a transition plan, like um, how to reflect work with individuals to reflect on their vision and, and future goals, build upon their uh, identified strengths and support systems, promote independent self-determination and community inclusion, and address individual and familial needs. And you'll notice that in this fourth module, we walk back to the second module and we re-articulate this particular uh, diagram um, and really just re-articulating that having a sense of community um, and having experiences of connectedness, belonging, it's really crucial to an individual's well-being. And so community engagement can mean all of these different things. It can mean access to health and social services, to nutrition, um, medical and fitness programs, and it can really help build social support but also that there's a role for so many different types of providers in supporting individuals with FASD. And in the final section of the module, we talk about um, supporting adults. And so participants will walk through the ways that they can support adults in areas like adaptive skills, employment, housing, and parenting. And we link to resources that support um, individuals with FASD and adapt building adaptive skills, such as this particular resource, from um, Community Living BC, which offers strategies to support uh, individuals with FASD in their adaptive skills, including in building daily routines. We also walk through employment considerations, um, such as individuals with FASD may have challenges in paying attention or sitting for extended periods of time, but they also excel in roles where empathy and non-judgmental attitudes are forward facing. And so by using guides like this one from CanFast or linking through other employment reports that are available in the module, um, employment professionals and programs and employers can really think about what the best fit for folks may be. And the last thing I'm gonna mention um, from this particular module is um, this housing 
uh, document that was released by CanFast with the Al University of Alberta that outlines a range of housing models and a harmonized housing framework that responds to the evolving needs of individuals with FASD that experience precarious and unstable housing. And so the hope is by providing all of these different resources and pairing that with information and learning opportunities that folks are able to identify what their role in supporting individuals may be and how they can also work with others in creating this more unified approach to support. So why are these modules important? Well, by understanding the FASD continuum of care, we're really talking about stigma reduction. We're talking about collaboration, and we're also talking about increasing support without increasing, um, without adding extra burdens into our day-to-day -day roles. Everyone has so much work on their plate. And so the hope is that by everyone taking this course, we can really build a unified approach that sort of builds a puzzle and that all of us are different puzzle pieces. Having these modules that go across the lifespan and the FASD continuum also allow us to think about how we can support individuals in different stages of their lives. And lastly, by increasing the availability to virtual courses, particularly right now where we're not able to do a lot of in-person learning, we're really able to support adults and adolescents with FASD and uh, those who may be at risk of having an alcohol exposed pregnancy. And these courses really act as a catalyst for stigma reduction by increasing awareness, equipping providers with tools and resources for working with individuals with FASD, and increasing confidence and competence in working with both individuals with FASD and with women. So these are so fundamental. And I really hope that as this course comes online in the spring, that you engage in this course and, and you're able to see today why it's so important for so many of us to be taking it. So thank you so much.